dismiss the kids' church at this time. And so if you'll follow Mr. Lee right out this, uh, he's going this way. So make sure you don't get in there before he does. By the way, our kids were really good this morning. And uh, did you notice that in the service? They were just excellent. So I want to commend you kids for that. If everyone else will turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I feel like I'm speaking in a tunnel or something. I don't know. It sounds a little funny this morning again, doesn't it? Matthew chapter 10. I should mess with it or not. Okay. <clears throat> I want to look at uh, verse 1 of chapter 10, and uh, then when, you, when we read it, then I'd like to just go back to verse 36 to 38 of chapter 9. Okay, so you have chapter 10, and let's look at verse 1. The Bible says, speaking of Jesus, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples... He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses, sickness and all manner of disease. Now go back to verse 36 of chapter 9, will you please? Speaking of Jesus, actually verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing the, every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us this morning to not miss, Lord, first of all, Your heart. Not miss the opportunity to see who You are. And then secondly, God, not to miss the simplicity of Your plan for laborers. And I ask Your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we were really in this same part of just a series of examples or stories about what Jesus did, which are an example that help us to have a perspective on really the heart of Jesus, who He was. Uh, last week, we looked at the fact that uh, Jesus uh, was eating with publicans and sinners, and the people looked and questioned His motive in eating with publicans and sinners. Their question really was, uh, why eateth your master with public and sinners? And his answer simply was, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. In other words, because they need me to. And we saw an exposure. If you want to just, just look into the heart of God, we would understand that God is the kind of a God who sees people's needs and cares. That's actually incredible to me because oftentimes we as humans have to be able to relate in order to care. Oftentimes we have to relate to somebody or see things from a different perspective. It's amazing uh, how often actually people, if they don't relate to something, how often things just don't bother them and they'll say things like, not my problem, not my, you know, you know, and they, nowadays the, the I don't care statement isn't so, uh, isn't so prevalent to actually say the words, but the idea of it's still just the same. Normally, we have things that we are concerned with, things that bother us and things we don't. But if you'll think about things, if as much as is humanly possible, you can place yourself in the position of holy God in heaven who is sinless, who has been wronged by man because of man's sin. If you can just put yourself in the perspective of a God who has made man perfect, given man a perfect opportunity, uh, and man has sinned against him, and you ask yourself the question, how much should a righteous God care for a sinful man? You know, it's interesting, God's love for man did not change at the fall. You ever, you ever think about that? You ever ponder that truth? God's love for man did not change at the fall. It's amazing to me. You know, what was it before man fell? Well, in the garden, the Bible says that God walked with Adam. They walked together in the garden. In other words, they had fellowship. Uh, God communed with man. We know that God made man in His image. We know that God, man, when God was creating the world, creating the earth, 
Man was made very differently than everything else God created. Anything else God created, He spoke into existence. When God made man, He formed him out of the dust of the ground, and He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and God made man in His own image. That is, physically speaking, what did Jesus look like? Well, He looked like a man. He just looked like a man. That's what God looks like. He looks like a man. Uh, obviously, God is man without sin, but man was made in God's image, and man was made to commune with God or to fellowship with God, to have a special relationship with God. I am certain that God uh, delighted in His perfect creation, but let me ask you a practical question. Creation today being cursed, how much does creation delight God? It's not what He made it to be, is it? I mean, honestly, you know, you and I see the beauty of creation. Even with its flaws, we can see God. The Bible teaches that. That's how one of the ways that we know there's God, if there's a God, is because of the beauty of God's creation. Creation is so amazing that it points to God as its creator. But I'm not trying to develop a concept or an idea, but, you know, God doesn't love creation like God loves man. And the moment man sinned, God gave a promise of a Redeemer. You know, the moment man sinned, God took and showed them how to make a sacrifice for sin. Showed them. They tried to cover themselves with leaves, and God covered them with what? With the coat of a lamb, with a lamb's coat. And they sacrificed a lamb for them as a picture. God never stopped loving man. Listen to me, my friend. God's love for mankind has never changed, even at the fall. That's incredible, isn't it? You know, I believe Adam will be in heaven, don't you? I think Adam and Eve will both be in heaven. Both of them were looking for a Redeemer to redeem them back to what they were before they fell from God. And that's because God loves man. That touches me. touches my heart. When I ponder and when I just think about God, one of the characteristics of God that I realize is that God loves man. And so really it's no surprise, is it, that when Jesus came that he made a statement like, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, we think God should love perfect man, but there's no such thing. In reality, God loves sinful man. I love that sinners Jesus will receive, sound his word of grace to all, who the heavenly pathway leave, all who linger, all who fall, sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive a sinful man. Doesn't that song touch your heart? Make the message clear and plain. Christ receiveth sinful man. So let me ask you a question. I, I, don't, I don't want to be silly about it, but what kind of people does God prefer? What kind of men? Sinful men. In other words, it isn't that the Bible's teaching that there's anything but sinners. You know, there are the sinners, and then there are the righteous. No, the fact of the matter is, though, that the, the people who think they're righteous don't see themselves as a sinner, and they see no need for a Savior. And God is looking for needy people. My friend, one of the best things you can do, even after you know God, is to recognize your need. It's amazing how self-reliant, self-dependent we can be, even after we needed Christ in the work of the cross, how self-reliant we can be, even for the needs that we have, and particularly for spiritual victory. And God loves needy people. God loves, God's heart is to needy people. We saw a picture of Jesus' heart. There are a number of other examples in chapter 9, but the one that I wanted to preach last week and didn't have the opportunity to, because we really were over on time, uh, is when Jesus saw the multitudes. So, in verse 35, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Did you notice that little word that's inserted there? Every sickness and every disease? I mean, Jesus universally met every person's need. When He'd go to the villages, every person in the village that came to Him was healed. Every person who had a sickness was healed. That's amazing, isn't it? So what's the heart of Jesus? It's amazing, isn't it? It's an incredible that uh, individuals who name the name of Christ try to teach a doctrine that God loves some and God doesn't love others. 
You don't see Jesus going to the, to the villages and saying, well, you know what, I'm going to have my disciples set up a 12-point station where we can check and make sure you're qualified for healing. How much do you love me? How good are you? How whatever. We put them through a process, and if you make it through the process, then Jesus will heal you. No, Jesus just went to the village and healed everybody. That's the way salvation is, my friend. You want to try to figure out who God wants to save, my friend, just look around and add everyone to the list. God, who will have all men to be saved. And as we see this glimpse into the heart of, the, of Jesus, one of the things that clearly is shown forth is that God heals everyone. God loves everyone. Now, I'm not trying to just be this, you know, God is love and God loves every one person, my friend. The fact of the matter is, is that the love of God is not what it is, uh, what it is twisted in, in a culture and society today to mean. Uh, recently, I preached the gospel and I had someone get up after me uh, and uh, they emphasized the love of God. Twice this has happened. In the last, oh, six months or so, I've preached the gospel and then right afterward, I have somebody get up and say, you know, you know, being a Christian is all about love. And what they mean by love isn't you know, all about the love of God to die for sin, to die for sinners. It's all about the fact that God loves us in spite of what we are. No, it's just God just accepts everything. God accepts everybody because God's love. That's a lie. My friend, the love of God is that even when we were yet without strength, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for the unrighteous. That's us. That's love. And so we get this snapshot or we get this open view into the heart of Jesus by a lot of the things that He did. And one of the things that He did was He went to all the cities and villages and He preached the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now notice verse 36. And I just, this is just amazing to me. Matter of fact, when you look at it in other, in other gospels, this account, there's even more information. But I want to just kind of stick to the facts this morning. Verse 36. When He saw the multitudes, He was moved. Did I say I want to just stick to the facts as opposed to, let's read from another passage, the, the, the not facts. I did not mean to say it that way. I'm sorry for presenting it that way. Uh, what I meant was I want to stick to this passage this morning because we, get, you know, just getting the simple truths are enough. So let me just throw out the extras that that I would have shared uh, for you. In in the other gospel, when Jesus goes to the well and he meets with the Samaritan woman, this is one of the places where we see that uh, Jesus sent his disciples into the village to get food because he hadn't eaten all day and he was actually so hungry that he actually just had to sit down. So he'd been walking, he'd been traveling, he was at the point of physical uh, fatigue. And when he was there, he met the Samaritan woman. And she came to him, remember, and he asked her to draw water for him. And she said, how can you, being a Jew, ask water from me, who am a Samaritan? And there's a pretty solid question because actually, uh, when Jesus came preaching the gospel, uh, this time he preached it to the Jews. That was what was so notable about the centurion that came to Jesus, was that he was not Jewish. And yet Jesus said, I'll come and heal him, speaking of his son. So Jesus is really, really doing business with the economy of the Jewish people. And when, this, when he's with the Samaritan woman, you know, she asked him the question. And he said, if you knew who it was that asked you, he said, you'd ask him and he'd give you living water so you'd never thirst again. And then she began to ask spiritual questions. She asked the question of, our fathers, you know, we worship in the mountain, but the Jews say we have to worship God in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, God's a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so He said, yeah, you know what? You can worship God for anywhere, but the truth is, is that God wants to be worshipped at Jerusalem. So worship God His way. And then after that, the lady went into the village and she said, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. He told her that, you know, she had not one husband, but she had five husbands, and the man she was living with wasn't her husband. And uh, he told her about her sin, and yet he gave her eternal life. And then, so then the Bible says the whole village came out. This is while the disciples are going into town to get food. Jesus preaches the gospel to all the people that come out, and then he says, um, they said to him, Master, eat, and he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. In other words, he's literally physically fatigued, so tired that he has to stop. And yet he has time to preach the gospel. And he has the time to uh, save a, an adulterous woman. And he has time 
to save everybody in the village. And he has time uh, to have compassion on the multitudes. And this is really the other context of when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. So the Bible says they fainted like sheep that were without a shepherd. you and I are going to have the heart of our Savior, my friend, there's an appropriate place for compassion. There's an appropriate place for compassion. I fear that we think that hard gospel preaching emphasizes disgust more than it does compassion. It's always, when I'm honest about it, it's always amazing to me that we can be offended or outraged at someone's carnality or at the sin of the wicked knowing what we ourselves are. When we have a Savior who has compassion for the very individuals that we're disgusted by. <laughs> this, is, this is timely. This is, this is not my heart. This is not what I think. But I saw this yesterday from a preacher on social media. And he said something to the effect of, if tomorrow in your church people don't go to church because of the Super Bowl, and if tomorrow in your church uh, you cancel the evening service because of the Super Bowl, or you have a Super Bowl party at your church. You're godless. You don't love God. You are da 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 da. I didn't like his words, but it resonates with me. It irritates me that people worship a game more than they worship God. I'll be. I'm just being frank with you. I'm offended for God. Okay, <laughs> about it. I hate the Miami Dolphins. You're, you Dolphins fans here, I just hate them. And I'll tell you when I started hating them. I was young in the ministry. I had all the zeal to preach the gospel. And I had a guy that was doing pretty well in my Sunday school class. And he said, I won't be seeing you for a while. And I said, why are you going somewhere? He said, no. He said, my Dolphins start playing next week and I won't be going to church anymore until the season's over. And I've hated the Dolphins ever since. I was telling you, you know, I, I realize that there are other teams in the NFL that people do the same thing for, but the Dolphins are just personal. For me, I don't hate the Miami Heat. Uh, I feel bad for the Marlins, uh, but I just hate the Dolphins because because that man in our church, and I want to tell you something, destroyed his children. That man in our church worshipped the game more than he worshipped Jesus, and uh, so that's the way I feel. But I don't feel like that about anybody that's going to skip church tonight and doesn't want to hear me preach. Would rather watch, uh, you know, Tom Brady break or set new records and. So forth. Uh, <laughs> Andrew's going to throw his Bible down and walk out. <laughs> he's wearing eagle socks, aren't you? Yeah, he's got, he's got eagle socks on. All right. So here's the deal. I wonder if Jesus would have said what that man said. In other words, are in fact people who are going to watch the Super Bowl today, or churches who are going to have Super Bowl parties today, does Jesus view them the way that man views them? The, the, see, there's kind of two sides to the coin, isn't there? In other words, does it edify and worship Christ to worship a game instead of Him? to give a game a place of greater importance than, than the Savior who died for them. And honestly, in the hearts of people, the game, you know, it's today that today the game's just bigger. I've just got to be honest. Just got to be real. That's what people would say. Okay. But, and I, I, this is just timely. It's the only reason it's come up. Uh, I, this is not me off on a terror, on a rant about it. I, I was angry about it like uh, almost 20 years ago, and I'm not really, I'm, I'm almost over except I still hate the Dolphins. Okay. <laughs> So, in case you want to know. <laughs> but I think Jesus, I think the heart of Jesus would be compassionate. In other words, the more a person's a sinner, I think the more Jesus would see them as sheep having no shepherd. It's amazing, isn't it, that a Christian, a person who is identified as a Christian because they've identified with Jesus... Let's, let's dial it back. Okay, Where were Christians identified with Jesus? Antioch, right? Mm -hmm. When it became more than just a sect of Judaism that people were followers of Jesus Christ. So being a Christian, and in the actual sense, not the generic sense, but in the actual sense means you've identified with Jesus. Which means what? 
It means that Jesus shed His life's blood for you and that you received Him as your Savior and you're God's child. It's amazing that someone who has experienced that would lack compassion, actually. Do you remember the parable that Jesus told of the man who forgave a man? Remember that? And the same man had someone who owed him a lot less. And he went and he demanded, he said, you pay me or I'll put you in prison. The man couldn't pay him, he put him in prison. We tend to have that in our hearts, don't we? We tend to look at somebody and say, how could, you ever said, how could anyone, how could they? My friend, if you don't know the answer to the question, ask it to yourself privately in context sometime. How could I? If you, don't know the, if you don't know how someone could, you've forgotten that there's a Savior who does and has compassion. <coughs> we need compassion. I'm not saying we need to withhold truth. I'm not saying we need to, in a sense, pull punches when it comes to giving people the truth that they need. But you know, it's amazing to me that Jesus' truth was always with compassion. Always gave truth with compassion. It's incredible. It's incredible that God, who had every right to be offended, that Jesus, who was the one who was going to die and be the payment, the sin sacrifice, had compassion. Friend, it ought to impress you. Oh, it's not a complex, it's not a complex passage. There isn't some deep underlying hidden meaning. My friend, it's the meaning that's right on the surface that we need to exercise that we need to understand. Listen, if I'm a child of God, if I'm a, a follower of Jesus Christ, if I'm one of His disciples, one of my characteristics then ought to be compassion. Yesterday I was driving by the building, uh, this Center for Spiritual Living down the street here. You know what that is. It's Christian science. It's a cult. And uh, I was driving by, the, I don't know why, but they moved out of a large building uh, right off of Dixie Highway at 26. Do you know where that is? Yeah. Right in Wilton Manors? Yeah. And uh, they've got a, it's a huge building. By the way, if one of y'all wants to buy it for the church, we can move right there. That'd be a great location for us. Big parking lot, lots of facilities. We could start a Christian school, a lot more uh, Sunday school classes, all those things. I was driving by that building yesterday with Anthony, and I noticed a couple ladies walking by holding hands, and they weren't like, you know, in grade school, like where girls do that and that sort of thing, because it's adjacent to Wilton Manors, which has tried to wrap an identity around homosexuality. I got a call a while back from someone who used to live in Fort Lauderdale, and they said, you know, I just had to move out of there. There are just so many perverted, disgusting people. I just had to move away. And I, you know what I think? I think maybe Jesus would have planted the first church in Wilton Manors. Mm -hmm. Because that's where people need the most compassion. I'd love to be there. I mean, I'm just being frank with you. I'd love to be right on Wilton Drive. Serious. Because there are more hurting people there than there are anywhere else in our county. And those are people who need compassion. You say, Pastor, don't you know how wicked? My friend, I know about this guy. And I know if Jesus hadn't died for my sins, I'd go to hell. That's what I know. And I know what kind of a Savior Jesus is. He's kind of the Savior who, when He saw the multitudes, the Bible said He was moved with compassion on them. Here's why. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. I don't know how many times in my life I've uh, run into someone who is just literally a slave to a sinful, wicked lifestyle. And I could actually see in their faces that they just had no hope. There's just a hopelessness. There's just an absolute despair. They just don't even know that there's hell. You know, I think, I'm afraid that too many times if they went to the place where people ought to know what the help is, they would be just told, God hates you. God doesn't love you. God can't save you. My friend, they wouldn't have been told that by Jesus. I would say he was moved with compassion. What moved him with compassion? Their aimless, scattered wickedness. In other words, the reason he was compassionate was because they were such a mess. I think that a ministry that reflects the heart of Jesus 
ought to have a strong emphasis on down and outers, on folks that are that are just obviously away from the truth. Those are tough ministries, aren't they? They're difficult. You know, sometimes it's hard to love people that have done things that disgust us. Which sin do you think would have been beautiful to Jesus as He was crucified for it on the cross? Maybe greed would have been one where He'd say, well, that's one, that's a nice one. Maybe lying would be one where He'd say, well, you know something, compared to the bad ones. Maybe <laughs> you could just list the things that we think aren't real big deals. A rebellion, maybe uh, hatred of persons hating their brothers, or maybe bitterness or unforgiveness. Maybe those aren't such a big deal. My friend, I just want to tell you something. Sin crucified our Savior. My sin crucified our Savior. I haven't done the things by the grace of God that many others have done. I can't even say with Paul, to be quite frank with you, that I'm the chief of sinners. That's not a prideful position, but my friend, when Paul said he was the chief of sinners, he had a list of credentials. The things Paul had done, my friend, he was a murderer. He murdered innocent people, harassed followers of Jesus Christ. How would you like to have to answer to God for that one? Could you imagine? Could you imagine at Stephen's death when individuals were throwing rocks at him and killing that innocent man? And Saul stood by there consenting to his death. Could you imagine if Saul got what he deserved then? You ever think about that? What if Saul got what he deserved when he was murdering the followers of Jesus Christ? You think God has a heart for the martyrs? Read Revelation sometime. <coughs> Read about the fact that God has kept every single thing that was ever done against His children. And God has reserved judgment for it. And it's coming. Oh, God has a heart for the martyrs. Stephen was the first church, first martyr in the church. And Saul was right there. He was the instigator. He was the one consenting to his death, enabling people to do what they did. And he's the one that went into homes and houses. And when Saul said he was the chief of sinners, my friend, there was no exaggeration. I'm not the chief of sinners as far as that goes. I'm just a wicked guy saved by the grace of God. See, I got saved when I was four years old. Up to that point, I didn't think my sin was a big deal. When the first moment I realized that my sin was against God and that He was evil, my friend, I was under great conviction about it and I got saved right then. I asked Jesus to save me as a child. And God's Spirit came in me and I'll be quite honest with you, I have a track record of living for Jesus most of my life. I don't have moments in my teen years where I was away from God and living a wicked life. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never drank alcohol. Well, I took NyQuil. I quit doing that, though. It makes me feel bad. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a track record of doing those things. I'm not bragging before you guys. I'm not trying to tell you I've done something. I just, God's was very gracious in my life. But every sin I've ever committed would have crucified our Savior. And every sin I ever committed would, would uh, it, it really condemns me to hell if I were to stand in my sin. And I'm glad God had compassion for me. You know, when any time I start thinking, you know, oh, those people, I can't believe. All I need to do is look at this example of Jesus. By the way, it's one of the most often stated, or the Gospel of Matthew states this over and over again about Jesus. When He saw the blind, He had compassion. When he, saw the, when he saw, he had compassion, he had compassion, he had compassion. It is a characteristic of our Savior. And if you and I are named by the name of Jesus Christ because we're followers of Christ, then compassion ought to be one of our characteristics. It's so vitally important, isn't it? Listen, do people do things that because of sin are disgusting? They sure do. Can you relate? Or do you think your sin is lovely somehow? Jesus had compassion. That's the simple truth. Let's look at another one. The Bible says in verse 37, Then saith he to his disciples, or unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. 
Friend, if this isn't simple, I don't know what is. Is Jesus was Jesus looking into fields when he said the harvest is truly is plenteous? The har what was he looking at? People. He was looking at people, the kind of people that are scattered as sheep having no shepherd, people that were wandering away from the shepherd. And he said there's a great harvest there. It's a great harvest, it's plenteous, but the laborers are few. Now, I don't know how many times I have had individuals emphasize the pray God will send forth laborers. You know, I'm just about done praying it that way. I'm not saying the way the Scripture phrases is incorrect, but the attitude behind it is incorrect. Because the first verse that we read today was when Jesus told, who had told His disciples to pray the Lord of harvest to send forth laborers. Verse 1 of chapter 10 tells us that Jesus sent His disciples two by two. So what do you think it means when Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest that He'll send forth laborers? When He told His disciples, pray that God will send forth laborers, and the next thing you know He's sending them, what do you think it means? You know, I fear, and it's different in our church, but I've been in the independent Baptist church a long time, and boy, we have a big emphasis of missions in our churches. Our church emphasizes church planting as our, our outreach and our missions. One of the reasons we want to do that, we want to have that kind of a heartbeat, is because I fear that oftentimes we want to hire laborers. God raise up laborers, and honestly, I'm willing to fund them so long as I don't have to be one of them. Now, there's oftentimes not a lot of glamour, is there? and be a, being a laborer into God's harvest. A lot of times, God, we need more missionaries. Hey, how many of you think we need more pastors? How many think we need more pastors? How many think we need more churches? I do. I, I believe God is calling more men to preach the gospel than are going. Don't you? I think that just about every time I preach, in our church, there are men under the sound of my voice that God wants to be gospel preachers. Not many are going. But what is Jesus implying when He says to His disciples, pray the Lord of the harvest that I'll send forth laborers? He's saying, pray God will make you a laborer. When was the last time you prayed and said, God, could I be a harvester? Could I be somebody that goes out and reaps the harvest. When I try to teach people about sharing the gospel, a lot of times the pushback that I get is, Pastor, you don't understand how hard these people are. I don't know how feels. Pastor, you don't understand, you know, how hard these people are. Listen, I've seen hardened people before, but what I want to say is you don't understand how many lost people there are who are just wandering like sheep without a shepherd. You don't understand how big, how great the harvest is. Listen, if you'll go and be a laborer, you'll, you'll reap a harvest. It's incredible, actually, that we think that we, we should be able to, or that there's an excuse for preaching the gospel and not pay, seeing people saved. You know something I've, I, I uh, realize and I want to emphasize for our church more and more? Anytime we schedule some kind of a special event or activity where we can get lost people to come, we pretty much can guarantee that people will be saved. It's just like a guarantee. If there's lost people, we preach the gospel to them, we have an invitation, people will trust Jesus. Last year I scheduled a, a, a basketball tournament for the teams. I scheduled VBS. Well, our church scheduled. I shouldn't say I scheduled. Uh, our church scheduled. Uh, uh, VBS, a, a, a basketball outreach and teen revival. You know all three of those events, we had a lot of people saved. It's just what happens. We hardly had any kids come to the basketball tournament this year compared to what we wanted to have, and yet we had uh, a couple kids saved. It's just what God does. And when I preach the gospel, my friend, God saves people. And yet we think sometimes we need to pray that God will send somebody somewhere where the harvest is great, and we actually live in the greatest harvest. And I think that the reason we don't see it... The, with the burden that Jesus does is because first we lack the compassion Jesus had. It's the last time you realize that the person you know who's lost, if they perish, will spend eternity in hell. 
Well, this year, man, I, I, I've had so many people call me and tell me about someone that they know that's died. Pastor, pray for me. I just lost this person. This person just died. You know, in many of those instances, they've been believers, but in some of those instances, they have not. You know what a tragedy it is if somebody perishes into outer darkness? Do you see the face of the person that you are friends with, but not enough of a friend to implore them to receive Christ as their Savior? Do you see them as a person who's going to perish into eternal hell forever? That's what Jesus saw. And He had compassion. See a person there acting out a lifestyle or acting out a way. It's wicked. That's against what God created, what God wanted. Do you see him as a person who's going to spend eternity in hell? Because that's what Jesus sees. You know, sometimes what I have to ask before I can ever ask that God will send laborers, that God will just give me a passion and a compassion and a burden. To even care. To even be inconvenienced. I've had so many times lost people describe this. You know, Pastor, you know, good luck. But that they, he's, he's not going to get saved. That person's not going to get saved. And you ask why? Well, because you know how wicked they are. You know how bad. You know, I'm going to tell you, that's the kind of people God saves. Wicked people. When I think about it, I just think of my my personality, the kind of a personality I have, the kind of character I have, I'm always impressed that it, people that know my personality would think, you know what, he'd probably never be a Christian. I, I'm not an emotional person. A lot of Christians are kind of, you know, this is the impression people have, a lot of Christians, you know, they just kind of put their emotions out there. And, and uh, I've met a lot of Christians that are that way. I'm not saying anything about that. I'm just saying that's not me. I... Uh, I don't like, you know, a lot of people dress up for church. I'm not a dress up kind of guy. You see me during the week, you're going to see grease all over me. I don't know how it happens. I try so hard not to work on things. And uh, my fingernails are always dirty. My hands are always skinned up. They just, just are. That's the kind of person I am. Uh, if you were to describe my personality, I'd be way more likely to be found out in the woods or out on the water somewhere than in church on Sunday. Something happened to me that's real, and that's that I saw my need for a Savior. And God changed my heart. And all of a sudden, a guy who I'd say, you know, wouldn't really be the church kind of guy, goes to church probably more than anybody I know. I don't know if I know anybody that goes to church more than I do in a week's time. When I get out of church here, you know where I'm going? Church. I'm going to church. You go to Miami Beach. Charlie's going too. Everybody but Charlie, I'd say, is the only guy I know that goes to church as much as I do. We're going to go to church. We're going to go to Sunday school down there. And then we're going to come back. You know what we're doing? We're going to church. We'll be here Wednesday night. We'll be here for Tuesday night. So when Charlie won't because he doesn't want to be. Uh, but <laughs> we'll be here Tuesday night. I'll be back at church in Miami Beach on Thursday night. And I have to miss. I have to go do a wedding. And I have to miss being in our church in a couple of weeks. And I'm upset about it. I got asked to preach in another church this next week. I'm not going because I don't want to miss the afternoon services and being here, even to preach in another church because I don't want to miss being in our church. I'm a fanatic about it, to be quite honest with you. I think it's the only thing that matters in life. And I'm right about it too. Why is that? Well, because somebody had compassion on me. Jesus did. And He saved my soul. But in the same way that I love being a child of God's, I ought to see other people's needs for the same thing. If I need it, it doesn't everyone else. If I need it, it doesn't everybody else. If I need Jesus, doesn't everyone else? Yes, they do. If you need Jesus, don't your relatives? If you need Jesus, don't your friends? If you need Jesus, don't the people in our city? Don't your neighbors? Well, what's Jesus' mindset? Well, the Bible says when He saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion because they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And friend, that's the world we live in, and I don't think it's less true today than it was when Jesus was walking through religious Israel. 
Because that's where he was at. A bunch of religious people that were just as lost as they could be. And his response was, Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers. And then in chapter 10 and verse 1, he called unto him his twelve disciples, and he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And he goes on to talk about, he gives the commands, but he sent them to Israel to preach the gospel. What's God's heart? What's God's heart? What's the manner that we preach the gospel? What's God's heart? What's the manner? Compassion. Jesus is burdened for the lost. My friend, if Jesus, our Savior, is burdened for the lost, should I be? And should you be? Now, as I said before, there's not a, this is not a complex message where you have to find underlying hidden meaning. It's just one of those passages of Scriptures that so encapsulates the heart of our Savior. Just like when Jesus was eating with publicans and sinners. And He said, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. My friend, we ought to look at people that are sick and see a need and be moved to compassion. Father, I just pray that You would help us to have the heart of our Savior. Lord, as we... As we go about our week, as we even go about our day today, may you help us to see lost souls who have no shepherd, who have no hope outside of Jesus. And God, may our response be, Lord, make me a laborer in your harvest. God, make me a laborer. Or so often we're so ready to expect someone else to do something. So often we say, somebody ought to. When you tell us, to pray for laborers, and then you sent the very individuals you said to pray into the harvest. Will you send us? Thank you for this passage of Scripture that shows us your heart, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a minute, we're going to uh, conclude our services. Before we do that, I'd like to take just a moment and just make sure uh, that uh, every person here knows for, knows for certain that you have eternal life. And so I want to ask just for a private moment between you and God, God knowing your heart, and you just sharing with me in a very private way. So I'd ask that every person here uh, this afternoon would just uh, just for a moment close your eyes. And you can bow your heads if you like to, but don't lean forward. Stay awake because I want to ask everybody questions, and I'd like you to hear the question. The first question I want to ask uh, with your eyes closed would be, do you know for certain that Jesus is your Savior? If you were to die today, if you were to die today, would you know that to be absent from the body would be to be present with the Lord? Do you know that you have eternal life? If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, you know, that's a question that I don't know the answer to, or I hope I know the answer to, but I'm not certain that I have eternal life. But that's something that right now I'm wondering about. I wonder if I would fit into the category of people that Jesus had compassion on because I'm like one that has no shepherd. That's me today. I, I see that Jesus has compassion on me, but I don't know that I have eternal life. Would you just slip your hand up? Pastor, that's me. I don't know I have eternal life. Will you please pray for me? Okay, now here's a second question. Pastor, I tend to be more like the Pharisees sometimes when it comes to seeing sinners. I tend to be like a person who sees other sins and I overlook my own. And I tend to be very, very uncompassionate toward the wicked. And yet, when I see Jesus in His example, I'm reminded that God wants me to have a compassion like Christ. God's shown me this, but I need to apply it to my life. And God needs to do a work in my heart to do that. Would you pray for me? I, I God's shown me, but God needs to do a work in my heart. Just, just slip your hands up, slip them right back down. Okay, that's a number of folks that have responded this morning. So what I'm going to do this morning is just a little different. We're not going to play a song. We're not going to have the piano play. I'd just like to have a moment of silence here and just let you do business with God and then I'll pray for you. You just go ahead and tell God, God, you've shown me something. You've spoken to me. There's so many of us here today who say, God's shown me something. God's spoken to me. Pray for me. You pray. You tell God and you ask God. You ask God and then I'll pray for you.
Lord Jesus, today you've used this message which lacks human eloquence to touch our hearts. You've shown us, you've diagnosed that though we have received so much compassion that oftentimes we lack it ourselves. And yet God, this is something our church so desperately needs. We need a compassion and a love for the lost. We need to see the wicked the way that you see them. And God, we need to respond to the need for the harvest by praying to be sent. Lord, for each individual, raise their hand today and say, pray for me. God's shown me that I need to have his compassion. Pray for me. I need to be a laborer in the harvest. God, this week, would you use your word, would you use this message, even as we would think a thought that's contradictory to your word, would you use it to convict us, to show us truth? God, would you give us an opportunity to exercise what we've heard preached and what we've committed to you, would you give us a chance to exercise compassion? Lord, would you make it one of the chief characteristics of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? Would you make us a compassionate church? Would you give us, Holy Spirit, guilt and conviction where we need it when we're not? And God, would you give us, just, just enable us to, to demonstrate the compassion that we desire? Work in our hearts. Continue to work. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Be with each person today as they're dismissed. Use us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for great attention this morning. I'm so glad that you are here. And uh, happy Mrs. Price's birthday. Her birthday's tomorrow, so we celebrate starting today. Oh, and, and happy Super Bowl Sunday uh, for all you folks. And I hope that you have a great day. We're going to be uh, continuing our series this evening at 6 p.m. on uh, Good Examples of bad examples, so I hope that you'll be here. God bless you. You're dismissed.